Thanks for joining us here at the Research Her, the show working to improve the health disparities for women of color, one topic at a time. And I am Alicia. I'm here learning and growing with you as we research our way to wellness. I am so excited to bring you all today's guest. It is my great sis, Dr. Corey Grayson. She is a biomedical engineer and a diversity advocate for women in STEM. She is a proud alumna of the HBCU Norfolk State University, where she earned her Bachelor of Science in Chemistry. Dr. Corey recently obtained her PhD in biomedical engineering from Cornell University, where she researched the cellular delivery of trail to treat metastatic castration resistance prostate cancer. Dr. Corey is the diversity chair for Women Doing Science, which is a IG account that showcases women in STEM from all over the world. She's also on the planning council for STEM Noir, a wellness and research retreat for black women in STEM. Recently, Corey accepted a postdoctoral research fellow position at the University of Michigan. So without further ado, I think that's the right way of saying it. Let's get to the conversation with my great sis, Dr. Corey Grayson. I'm gonna start us off with some icebreaker questions. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay, so if you weren't a scientist, what would you have been in your career? Honestly, I probably would have done medicine because I was really interested in pursuing an MD. I've shadowed a doctor, an LBGYN specifically, and I knew I kind of liked surgery. Even afterwards, when I do my mouth surgeries or when I was in the summer in New York shadowing a plastic surgeon there, I was like, I think I could definitely be a plastic surgeon. So probably MD, plastic surgery, that probably would have been more my route if I wasn't an actual research scientist. Next question, if you could break the law one time, what would you do? I would probably, something with money. It might be like robbing a bank, maybe a little bit of wire fraud. <laughs> you know, just move from this account to that account. Okay. <laughs> no, you know, overseas account in the Cayman Islands, something like that. Probably something with money. Hide it, take it. Oh, Lord, don't think I'm a bad person, but, you know. <laughs> yeah. Our currency, so having it, you know, moving it, putting it in stock spots, whatever, probably something related to that. Yes. So what led you to majoring in chemistry in undergrad? Actually, that's a kind of an interesting story. So I actually started in high school. I had an AP chemistry teacher, Miss Maudlin. She was like a young, fry, white woman, just had a kid, very young. I think she was like 29. And so she was super passionate about chemistry, making sure that we understood it and to pass, you know, the AP test that you take at the end to give you college credit. I was like, okay, I'm decent at chemistry, among other things, and as well, you know, calculus, because I took AP calculus as well. So when I got to college, I actually started off majoring in biology. And then, so I did biology for that semester, and then I also had to take general chemistry at the same time. So then my general chemistry professor, Dr. Katina Hall, this fierce AKA, was like, no, Corey you have way too much potential. You are more of an analytical thinker and problem solver. You need to be in chemistry. You, you do so well in my class. You're number one in the class. I need you to switch your major. So I ended up switching my major and stuck with it ever since. Okay, number one. <laughs> so with that, I think after I switched, a whole bunch of people that were biology ended up switching to chemistry as well. So we all kind of made a shift. Okay, STEM fluencer. <laughs> She got a lot of us. She was very passionate. She was a hard professor, but she was very passionate about what she did, what she talked about, making sure that we saw the connections with the real world and the applications. And so that made a lot of us switch. And by the end, you know, it was like 10 chemistry majors in my graduating class on my scholarship. Nice. That's really cool. So did you go to industry right out of undergrad or did you get your master's first? No. So I actually, which I don't recommend took a not well planned out gap year, which turned into two. <laughs> so I originally planned on going to medical school. I was going to study during that year, apply during that year. That way the next year I would start medical school. But I didn't really plan that well with, you know, studying for the MCAT, taking the MCAT. I didn't do so well on the MCAT. I took it twice. 
and I applied to MD PhD programs. So I wanted to do both. I wanted to do MD and I wanted to do PhD, but then I realized I really didn't want to do the MD part because I just felt like I didn't take it as seriously as others had. And if I really wanted to, I would have studied harder for the MCAT. So I let that dream go. And so during that first year of my two year gap years, I really was just kind of working on in jobs, retail, just to make money and kind of like survive. Um, thank God my aunt took me in or else I really don't know what I would have done. But then I started working at this industry job for Crow Life, which is a biomedical device company and started creating and manufacturing the hero graph, which is dialysis graph that patients undergo when they kind of have no other options. And so within that career, that's when I realized that with biomedical devices, I wanted to go towards biomedical engineering. So that job led me to where I am now. You So you kind of answered my next question, which was, why did you choose BME? And specifically, why did you choose to go to Cornell? I specifically chose BME because, again, my job, I was around biomedical devices, biomedical innovations. And I saw within that company, in order for you to move on from just like the manufacturing side of just building, maintaining the product, you kind of had to either have a master's or many, many years of experience. So my thing was, well, let me go back to school so I can either get a master's, PhD or above so that way I can have the ability to go to research and development and work more on that side versus just straight out manufacturing. So I ended up applying to grad school. So you know how med school, you apply to a whole bunch of schools to broaden your chances of getting in. Instead for grad school, I was like, I'm only applying for three. Like I'm not doing the whole, all these applications anymore. It's too expensive for me anyway. So I ended up applying to three schools, Georgia Tech, Duke, which had like two of the top programs at the time. I wanted to apply for John Hopkins, but they had an extra course requirement. And I was like, I'm not about to take any more courses. And then I applied to Cornell. And I was initially like, I thought about this a couple like days ago. And I'm like, why did I end up choosing Cornell? Like, how did it make it on the list? Because within the rankings, they were within the top, but not like the top top. And then I was like, I think I chose Cornell because I let me try one Ivy League. Let me just see what happened. So then I applied to all three. Georgia Tech, Duke said no. Um, but Cornell, the DGS at the time, Chris Schaefer, ended up reaching out calling me, leaving a voicemail. And for that, I was like, oh, okay, well, they must be serious if they want me to come. And then so I went out there for a visit, kind of saw, because I was a little iffy, because I really want to go to Georgia Tech. That was my number one school. I worked on a, the camp, like right outside the campus. I've done an internship at Georgia Tech. I'm like, I feel like that would be a better place. I love Atlanta. Let me try and really go here. But then I went to Cornell, met the people, I ran in the department. And then I just realized, especially after I won my two fellowships, so I won the NSF GRFP award, which was from the National Science Foundation. I got that before I started grad school. And then I won another one from the Cornell Institution itself, which is the Sloan Fellowship. From there, I was like, I think maybe God's trying to tell me you need to go to Cornell, Corey, and stop playing. Because I was going to defer, or actually I was going to apply to Georgia Tech again the next year. But I think after having all these signs and having a good visit, I was like, all right, this is where I'm going. They really want me. They care. They seem to care. And so I ended up choosing Cornell University. Nice. So when you got there, did you feel behind in your studies? I felt pretty behind because I was a chemistry major. A lot of my classmates or my cohort had majored in biomedical engineering as undergrads. Chemistry, you know, it's a different kind of course load. You focus mostly on, you know, analytical, biochem, pchem. Those are your courses that you take versus biomedical engineering. I know as a whole array of different engineering courses you have to take. So when I got there, I was behind in some engineering aspects. Like I hadn't done math lab. I didn't know sometimes the basic basic in uh, principles of engineering. So when I got there, as far as graduate school work, I had to take some undergrad classes such as fluid mechanics, you know, drug delivery to kind of get up to speed with the rest of my classmates because I had been working for two years and I hadn't even done research. So and when I got to my lab, it was more of a wet, you know, laptop bench. You do in vitro work. So like cell culture, I never worked with cell culture before. I never worked with a lot of the instruments that I started in my Ph.D. I worked more in the chemical chemistry space when I was in undergrad. So it was a complete 
180 for me as far as um, adjusting to a biomedical engineering type of course load and lab work. So I literally started from scratch. And so I know a lot of people ask me questions like, how did you make that transition? And I'm like, it wasn't easy. I had to take extra classes. I had to maybe be in lab longer or, try or read more on the instruments that I was using just because I had never done this stuff before. I think just my determination and tenacity and just wanting to know how things work, ending up working out. And now five years later, now Dr. Corey. So it can definitely happen. Exactly. It can. And I appreciate you for telling us that because you just think, okay, well, I went down a, the path of least resistance. So I'm a chemist. I went into a PhD program that did chemistry. For you, you literally had to start from the ground as a PhD student and work your way up. It just shows other people people that you too if you have a passion for a different field that is not your undergraduate coursework you can still do it you just have to work hard and know that that's what you truly want to do because at the end of the day if you don't it won't be worth it okay tell us a little bit about your experiences at Cornell and that sense of belonging did you feel like you belong did you feel represented talk about your experience at Cornell so initially when I went Mind you, before I was in Atlanta, Atlanta is a large, has a large black population, a large black successful population. And so when you kind of go from here, and then I also went to an HBCU, Norfolk State. So I was around a lot of colleagues and people that looked like me and could relate to me. So when you go from these environments and you, to somewhere like Ithaca, New York, where, you know, you're really the minority. And even at the school, you can see like more of a stark difference between the uh, amount of people of color, especially black people in a STEM space or in a STEM PhD program than you do anywhere else. So when I first got there, it was definitely a culture shock. I don't think things such as race really stood more out to me than when I was there. And so it was a little bit of an adjustment period because I was in a place where there wasn't a lot of people that looked like me. My family was nowhere around. Everyone lived in the South. You know, it's definitely a different change in the weather as well, being around snow. I think the first year I got there, it was like one of the worst snowstorms. So having to deal with that kind of weather and then also sometimes the sun not coming out for days. And so sometimes, you know, now I hadn't put that much emphasis into my mental health until I got there because of just the seasonal changes that would make you more question that. So it was definitely a complete 180, but I ended up making the adjustment and it becoming better because I found my community. So in my program, when I first started, I wasn't the only black woman. There were two others, and that was Dr. Monet Roberts and Dr. Tiffany St. Bernard. And so we three were the three black women in our cohort in the same year, which is pretty kind of rare and unheard of. And then also before us, we had three black PhD women and we had three or two black PhD men. And so that's actually in a lot of programs, that's a lot of black people. It's really not, right? It's less than 10 out of like a couple, like a hundred and something PhD students. But when you're in a space that literally is so predominantly not you, that's to us, that's a lot. And so within the BME department, you know, we had some resources, but also we had an office called Diversity Programs in Engineering. And so a lot of the black PhD students that were in engineering, we definitely made a family in that office. And so that was ran by Sarah Hernandez and then now Jamie Joyner, who is the head. And so they kind of created and cultivated this community of color between the undergrads and the grad students that we were able to come together. And then with my fellowship program, they made sure that all the people who had the fellowship, we all had lunch every single week and a speaker would come and talk to us. So it was these actual intentional moments where we either had to be a community or make community that made being at Cornell a lot better than when I first got there. Because if I hadn't been in that office with those people or met other PhD students in different engineering programs or just different programs across the university, where I made some of my really good friends. I really don't think I probably would have made it. I might have just mastered out. But having people who, again, look like you can relate, understand your struggles in your PhD, understand maybe some of your mental health problems or concerns, really can elevate you to stay in that program and be motivated to finish your work. I think forming a community and having people in your circle that really can relate to you will kind of keep you there 
and really keep you going throughout your program. So you chose a PI at some point and you were doing your research, doing your life as much as you can as a PhD student. Can you tell us how it was when he announced that he would be switching universities and how that impacted you? So, and again, I feel like my PhD is really unorthodox because who does that? <laughs> <It is. laughs> I come in, I've never done biomedical engineering coursework before. This is a new place for me. I've never been in Ithaca, New York. And then halfway throughout my PhD, my advisor was like, hey, we're moving. <laughs> so initially, I was actually very excited. I was ready to go. I was like, where, where are we going? Oh, we're going to Nashville. We're going hot, somewhere hotter. All right, cool. So, but before we left, um, I had to do my thesis proposal or my A exam, or I guess some people would call it their qualifying exam. And so that was like pretty stressful. So what happened was I actually worked on campus. I was a graduate RA, so I lived on campus and I had a year contract where I had to fulfill that. And so he left or the lab was moving in the middle of that. So I had to stay back because I needed to fulfill that contract. And then also because I hadn't passed my A exam yet. So when I was studying for my A exam, for prep, prepping for that, making the slides, writing the document, my advisor was not I'm there. I'm sorry, an A exam? Yeah, A exam, your thesis proposal. So he was actually not there. And it's more common for your advisor to be there to, you know, see what you've written, help you with the experiments. Like their actual physical presence sometimes can be a lot more helpful. So mine wasn't there. I was Skyping him from our old office. I was talking to him once a week, but most of the time I was isolated and literally in lab by myself. Uh, my whole lab had moved all out of the offices, all out of the lab. And I was literally in there by myself. And so I had to find more of like a surrogate lab with my committee member down in the basement. And so that was, you know, now I had to kind of find a home while he was gone and my whole lab was gone. That kind of made it a little bit more challenging. But within that, I was able to get through my exam, pass my exam with the help of my committee members and people in other labs. Like when I did my practice, I had people from literally other labs. No one in my lab could came because A, they weren't there. But the community that I had formed while I was there was willing to help me. It was a major transition. It was very lonely. It was something I had to get used to. But through that, I saw how much I could depend on myself, how much I could get through a situation, not necessarily have my advisor be there. And that's like one of the main components you really need through your PhD program. In the beginning, you rely on them so much to help you with experiment planning and you know your thought process and all these other things. But this process, I was able to see, okay, I can finish my PhD program and I can keep going. And so that was one of the things, although it was, it sucked at the time. So what it really pushed helped you me become the days? PhD scientist that I am now. I think I just got tired of not being in a space where I was being like productive. And so I think my mom, she really helped. She actually came down the day for my A exam and was actually, you know, very helpful, even though she didn't understand a word I said when I practiced in front of her. <laughs> And at the time, I was engaged to someone, and they were actually also making it kind of worse as far as like concentrating on finishing and doing my program. So I think ending that relationship before I took my A exam, focusing more on myself, having my community and having my mom come all made it a lot better to actually do that part and, and get through it. So I got rid of what was distracting me in my life and then just had more of what made me uh, concentrate more and support me more, which was my family, my friends and my colleagues at the time. Yes. Yeah, so you're in graduate school and you like you said, there aren't many of you all, but you have your community. But you do still see that there is a lack in people that look like you. Right. So you started using this hashtag on social media. Called, this is what a scientist looks like. So can you tell me what kind of inspired you to really push for it and that hashtag and start looking online to create community? I started using that hashtag like over a year ago. I made a post that had a t-shirt where with the same saying, this is what a scientist looks like, which was a gift from another PhD student. When I ended up taking that photo, I didn't realize how big of an impact that would have on the online community. When I posted it, I didn't just didn't 
really come to mind that it would have that big of an impact. And so I got a good response. I just started using like the hashtag, this is what a scientist looks like, redefining the image of a scientist. And it kind of just took off from there. But I started that part because I just wanted to show people that you can be more than what the typical image of a scientist looks like. When we think of a scientist, a lot of times we think of an you know, old white man with, with glasses, a lab coat or pop, pocket protector. And even also what motivated that is when I type in scientists on Google, what you see is literally either white men or white women. And that's not the case, especially in the field that I am, biomedical engineering. You have people of so many different races, creeds, colors, backgrounds, religions that is not represented in mainstream media. Even at the time when you look at Instagram and you see the influencers or the STEM influencers at that time, a lot of them were white men and white women. And it wasn't a lot of young black and STEM influencers. And even though it has gotten better, I just felt like the hashtag kind of really showcases the fact that we're not, we don't all look this way. We all have different kind of personalities. We have different looks. We have tattoos. We have piercings. We have colored hair. We have disabilities. We have these just all these different things that you wouldn't normally think of what a scientist looks like. And personally, for me, that whole hashtag isn't per se about physical looks. It's more about representation, increasing that representation, showing that representation. In order for us to maintain women, especially black women in STEM, we have to show them that we're out there and this is what we look like and this is what we do. Yes, I'm a scientist, but I still, you know, I like to dress this way. I listen to this kind of music. I do these types of activities and I'm not boxed in into this one thing that people think that I should do or that I should be. And so I think the message behind that is really just showing representation and increasing that among us and however that hashtag can speak to you. It's not about physical looks, about being attractive or anything like that. It's more about representation and showing the diversity of what scientists look like and what mm -hmm. we should And at what point did you realize that you were going to really highlight your experience and your journey through your PhD program and as a scientist and has Team Corey always been um it was it just your Instagram page or have you always in your mind said like oh, no this is going to be the documentation of my scientific career So I think for Team Corey, it literally just started off as like, all right, here's a random Instagram name. Matter of fact, I didn't even come up with the name my uh, roommate did at the time. She was like, you know what, I'm going to call you Team Corey. And I'm like, well, okay, well, why? And she was like, you just have all of these like guys who just want you to be their wife or something like that. It's like you have a whole <laughs> team behind you. So we're going to go with Team Corey. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> So that's how the name came. It wasn't even nothing like super, super thought out, but I continued with it. And that's how people kind of like, I guess, recognize me, <laughs> even in public. People like, you're Team Corey, right? And I'm like, yeah, who, who's asking? <laughs> but I think, again, I think about a year ago, I started to take social media a little bit more seriously and realizing my purpose and the lack of representation sometimes that I would see. So actually, no, maybe it's two years ago. And so I switched more into like an intentful approach. So I was like, let me chronicle or let me talk a little bit about what I'm going through grad school, not specifically my research, because there are a lot of Instagrams out there that talk specifically about science. But I felt like sometimes there was a lack in actually talking about experiences from black voices. So then it turned more into, OK, today, you guys, you know, or just be prepared about experiments failing like they fail all the time. You have to constantly work through that. Or today we're going to talk about being single in a PhD program and sometimes being single is good for you or we're going to talk about you know my hair and this is the way I wear my hair in the lab and it's some stuff might be a problem for some people but it's actually what grows out of my head so these are just the things that I just started talking about in my post and people just really started kind of gravitating to it and so I'm not really much of a, you know, I wasn't really much of a writer per se when it comes to like my own like personal writing because, you know, in PhD you write all the time. 
time as far as typing mm-hmm. and researching. But I think social media allowed me more to write about my story, think about it, edit it, and realize what people could relate to more. And so that's just more of what I posted. And people just really seem to take take to it. And now it's it's grown and it continues to keep growing. And so I'm just really excited to keep chronicling my journey, even through my postdoc. So stay tuned. Yes, we will. So Dr. Corey with a K went yeah. viral and she didn't just go viral. She went viral, viral. So if you listen to this one, why aren't you following team Corey? But <laughs> um, yeah, she went viral, like BET viral. Like she was on the pre-show for BET. What was that like? Well, with going viral, first of all, when I posted the video, so I was in Atlanta and I had done my graduation shoot. And so I hit up one of my photographer friends and I was like, hey, I want to come to Atlanta. I know it's Corona, but can can we do a, a shoot of some kind? And so we were just, you know, taking pictures, having a good time. And I said, you know what? I think I'm going to do this wipe it down video, but I'm going to do like my gown and stuff. I'm like, I got makeup on. I'm looking good. This ain't going to happen again for a while. So <laughs> let me take that moment and see the day. So, you know, I'm doing the video, which took way longer than I expected from filming it to then cutting it and then making sure everything like comes together. Ooh, I did it one day and then I think I put it together the next day. And so I was in my aunt's bathroom and then I put it together. I showed her. She's like, oh, that's cute. And I was like, I think it's cute too. And I was like, I'm going to post it. And so I posted it on, I think on Twitter, Instagram, and possibly Facebook. I'm not, I think I posted on those three social media platforms. And, you know, it was doing okay. This is normal numbers when it comes to things that I post. I was like, all right, cool. So then. I had um, the founder of Because of Them We Can reach out to me on Twitter. She was like, I really like your video. Can I repost it on, you know, the on Twitter? I was like, yeah, sure. That's fine. I'll send you the original. Here you go. So she posted it not only on their Twitter, on their Facebook, and also on their Instagram. <laughs> and then it really started doing numbers. And then D.L. Hughley picked it up. And then all these different platforms started picking it up on Twitter and on Instagram and on Facebook, HBCU Buzz and Black Excellence. And then it's just like HBCU alumni. Everything was just like people were just picking up and resharing it, resharing it, resharing it. And I was just like, oh, well, I think this kind of went viral now. <laughs> <laughs> I, think I, I think I just went viral, you know? <laughs> Even my brother called me. He's like, oh, you know what? You may think you're cool because you went viral, but I still know the nerdy you. So don't even play. <laughs> He's a hater. Right? He's a hater. Right? He's a hater, brother. Right. Hater. Like, he keeps me humble. Him and my mom and everyone else in my family, they keep me humble. And so it was like truly overwhelming, actually, to have all these people. My inbox was flooded. Um, on all different platforms. And so it was definitely, it took me a while to like kind of go through them and answer them or respond to the nice one or good ones. And so that took a while, but it was definitely something that I embraced. I appreciated. I was happy that it reached so many people and touched so many people. And I was excited for it. I still am. So people still repost it. And so so that led to the whole BET pre-award show for the BET um, Awards this year. So they kind of reached out to me. And at first I thought it was like a hoax. I'm like, okay, yeah, right. <laughs> but one of the producers reached out through Viacom and said, hey, we wanted to put it on the BET pre-award show. And I was like, all right, cool. And looked at the contract, you know, read that over and signed it, sent the video. And I didn't really think much of it. Sometimes when people do stuff like that, you don't really think it's going to happen. Or even in TV, it may not make it. So I listened. I think I was playing the pre-award show on my phone. And I was like doing a screen recording at the same time just to see if it happens. And I was talking to my friend. And then I heard the song. And then I like ran over to my phone. And I watched it. I was like, oh, snap. I want to be <laughs> I did a little happy dance, and I'm like, oh, this is crazy. And then so many people are like, hey, I don't know if you know, but you were just on the pre-award show. And I was like, yeah, I saw it too. 
So that led to that. That was the story behind that. And so I was just very appreciative of them using my video, making it a one up before Will Smith in the same type of circle. That's so dope. <laughs> I was so proud. I was like, she is overwhelmed right now. So I am just going, I posted my, you know, I don't really like to tag you when I post you on my stories. I just like post you like, look at her looking fat again. And I posted on my story. I was like, I'm not going to overwhelm my graces. But I was just like, my sis just blew up. Like come through. And then I saw you in the beat. See, I was like, oh my God, which is well-deserved. I always say it, like, I don't think that we highlight Black success in the matter of, like, education enough. Sometimes, like, I get, like, all fields are important, but I do think highlighting Black educated people is not done enough, in my opinion. So when I saw that, I just felt so warm and fuzzy, like, yes, us us academics are getting some acknowledgement for being bombed because we are sometimes swept under the rug as like school ain't for everybody. And it's not, but for us who did choose this route, like, and didn't want to go- get into creative, why can't we be embraced and be on the BTs and the essence just as much as those who took a more artistic route? I was so happy that you got that acknowledgement because academics deserve too. <laughs> And I've noticed that as well. I feel like a lot of women in STEM don't really get recognized unless we make national news. And not to cut or take away from the Dr. Idea Greens or the Dr. Kizzy's that are working on coronavirus or, you know, working on cancer. Those are sometimes the only times where we make it into the news. And sometimes we have to start with highlighting the people that are on sometimes the lower levels. And so we have to, because we have to, again, increase our representation. If we're going to show that, then we have to kind of be on these platforms. So one of my goals within the next year is to, you know, I'm going to talk to Essence. I'm going to talk to BET. Like, let's see we can do to really, really increase our presence on these Black platforms. That way people can know that there are other options for what you can do in STEM and what a career looks like in STEM. Along the same lines, how do you handle internet hatred? Because yes, there was a lot of love, but too, with that came a lot of internet haters. Right. And so for me, I think when it came to dealing with the hate, it was more specific to one platform. Every other platform showed love, even Twitter, and Twitter can be a weird place. Ooh, baby. But <laughs> the one platform where I felt the most hate or disregard or just like misunderstanding was on LinkedIn, which is surprising to me. This didn't come from the video, this didn't come from uh, my graduation or anything. This came from me making a post about dedicating my PhD to everyone that came before me. So my ancestors, my forefathers, my grandparents, you know, my brother, my sister, my parents, and all of those who have been senselessly killed by police. And so George Floyd, you know, Michael Brown, Breonna Taylor, all these names that I named. And because I dedicated my PhD that way, mind you, it's my PhD, my dedication, it literally rubbed a lot of people the wrong way in a way that I didn't see coming and I didn't expect. And so I think with that post on LinkedIn currently has like over 5 million views and all these different types of comments and interactions. But the comments made by some of the people have have been some of the most disheartening, disparaging ones that I've seen, you know, telling me that I'm making my PhD political, or I'm race baiting, I'm widening the divide. How could you uh, dedicate your degree to a criminal? And just all of these things that you wouldn't normally think would happen after a PhD celebration, I got. And so when it came to dealing with them, I think it just showed more of other people's willful ignorance and their implicit biases and their open racism that it made me think of just how far we have to go. So I actually posted a lot of those comments on my Instagram and people were like, why are you just block them? Just don't know. Y'all need to see that even after these riots with for George Floyd, that people still think this way about us, regardless of where we came from or what, you know, what we're doing. And so I need people to see that even in the midst of getting a PhD from a first generation college student, you can still get this type of backlash. And I know some people thought, well, just get your PhD. Why do you need to dedicate it to anybody? I think you're using this as like some type of political gain or something. And I I made a post later talking about everything about my being 
is political, even if I don't want it to be. Mm -hmm. You're black. Okay, tell your story. (laughs) I just got mad. I just got mad. I just was really surprised that it just rubbed so many people the wrong way. But I tried to respond in the best dignified way that I can. I still haven't taken the post down. I'm not erasing the comments. I'm leaving it up there for people to see. Because on LinkedIn, you can see where people work, who they work for, what they're doing. And they still had the audacity to leave some of these comments on there. So I'm going to continue to leave that post up because people need to see it. And then what made me think about it was, I feel like I'm doing something right if This is the kind of reaction that comes from it. And I'm not going to take it down. You're not going to dim my shine. I'm not going to quell my voice. If anything, you just made it louder. You just empowered me even more. And so I realized with dealing with the hatred, you can't talk to people who are willfully ignorant and don't want to have a discussion and don't want to open their minds to different possibilities and reasons. So a lot of the comments, I just started saying, okay, Chuck, okay, Karen. I just smiley faces, laughing faces, because at the end of the day, we're not going to have a fruitful argument. And I don't have time to sit here and argue with you about my Ph.D. and my dedication, because I can dedicate it to whoever the hell I want to. And so with dealing with the hatred, whatever that comes with social media, I just I just don't have the time or the patience. And I know my worth. I know my value and I know my intentions. And so no one's going to take that away from me. I must still be fly. And I'm definitely still Dr. Corey Grayson. So next. Can you discuss with us a little bit about like prostate cancer? Because that's where, you know, the main overarching umbrella of your research. And what does literature say about the causes of prostate cancer? And are there different types of prostate cancer? Mm-hmm. So. The literature for prostate cancer, it it seems to be a source of inflammation. So usually prostate cancer is associated with a lot of chronic inflammation. And so that just means that it's like, you know, a hot spot just for all the things that happen with inflammation as far as like, you know, redness, hotness, um, there's just different symptoms. And so inflammation can come from a myriad of different things. Uh, The prostate gland does filter and clean uh, semen. So it's removing toxins. So there's a theory that maybe some of the toxins could be added to the inflammation that's making it worse. But I think overall for prostate cancer, when you look at the literature, um, a lot of times it just stems from, again, this, this chronic environment, this chronic disease. And it is usually just um, can be due to genetics or environment or even diet. So there's multiple factors to getting prostate cancer. It's not kind of isolated to one, but they do know that inflammation is the main source. Within the research field, what we try to do as far as prostate cancer is kind of study it and at its different stages. So there's more different stages of prostate cancer than different types. So, you know, you have stage one to stage four. So usually you can have uh, cancer, which is just the overgrowth, continued overgrowth of cells isolated to the prostate, they can migrate to lymph nodes that are close to the prostate, or they can metastasize or spread to different organs within the human body and well, within the male body because it's a prostate, males have prostates. And so that's really the mechanism of how it works and just a little bit of insight into the disease. Mm-hmm. So how popular is it and what communities are impacted the most? So prostate cancer is more prevalent in Western communities. So if you live in North America, there are some incidences in the Caribbean and as well in some parts of of Africa. And a lot of this is kind of can be based on diet as well as region. But usually and unfortunately, uh, prostate cancer really is a major health disparity within the African-American community. And so there have been many studies that have shown African-American men have higher tumor rates, tumor volume. They either get diagnosed at later stages and also with more aggressive forms. And so our current research is trying to figure out why that happens and why that occurs. And it's just it has somewhat to do with genetics. They think it might be due to um, health or just how we eat and just all these different factors, but we're still trying to isolate and kind of figure out the main cause of why African-American men are affected by this disease more than white or Asian men. Mm -hmm. So are they more likely to die from it then, I'm assuming? 
yes, they are more likely to pass from prostate cancer. Um, it also may have to do with the distrust of the health system and then also catching it at later stages in African-American men. Um, there's just all these different kind of factors that we kind of have to take in. But definitely for African-American men, I always suggest to them, especially if it runs into your family, start getting screened early. That way, you know, you can have an idea in your able to catch it earlier as well. So tell us what does your thesis research get into and what does it show? Right. So for me, I chose prostate cancer. Uh, My grandfather passed two years ago from prostate cancer and he had lived with it for a couple years before that. And there have been other men in my family that have had other cancers such as colorectal or lung. But I ended up on prostate cancer just because of the major health disparity that it has. And so for my research, it was more about targeting and looking at the later stages. So within the first couple stages of prostate cancer, the five-year survival rate is almost 100%. So at these stages, it's a pretty curable disease. But when it spreads to other organs, that's when the five-year survival rate decreases to 30%. So it's pretty deadly once it starts to metastasize. And so my research more focuses on that stage and trying to help find a better treatment for that stage. So everything that's at stage four is more kind of palliative or there's more about treating certain symptoms than actually curative. And so one part of my research was looking at the environment more of prostate tumor. So what immune cells, you know, your immune cells are part of your immune system. They will attack anything that's foreign in your body and try to get rid of it to keep you healthy. But with cancer, since it's a chronic place of inflammation and inflammation has a lot of immune cells associated with it, I wanted to know what immune cells are being or are infiltrating into primary prostate tumors. So I used a mouse model to kind of look at that while also delivering a nanotherapy that has a protein on it that specifically targets cancer cells. That was one part of my research that um, I concluded, or that I did. And then so I saw that there were certain type of immune cells, and they also, you know, use this therapy to actually infiltrate and treat prostate primary tumors, which, which is good. And then moving on, I wanted to do more of a curative, hoping it would be curative, but using current chemotherapies that are used to treat advanced stage prostate cancer today. And so there's two, um, docetaxel and cabazitaxel. These are just chemotherapies that are used at this stage. And so I use those chemotherapies combined with that protein that specifically targets cancer cells and basically looked at the death and the synthesization of the cells to the protein and then also the mechanism behind it in 2D and in 3D cultures. So in 2D, it's just like, you know, you grow cells on a flat surface and then you can treat them in these different type of well plates. And in 3D, I actually made tumor spheroids, which is more physiologically relevant to actual tumors in the body. And then I also treated them with the same combination type of therapy. So in all in all, that was my whole dissertation was these three different projects that all came in to tell this story of how we could possibly think of better ways of treating prostate cancer at its advanced stage. Mm -hmm. And what can just your average Joe take away Mm -hmm. from your research? I think the larger implications for my research is that you can find or we can develop different ways and targeted delivery methods to treat primary as well as advanced stage prostate cancer in order to give patients at this stage better quality of life and also extend their overall survivability. And so with these different things at play, hopefully we can draw closer and closer to finding a cure for this stage where so many deaths happen and where a specific community is affected more than others. You're on your way to your postdoc or did you start already? Yeah, I'm in the beginning stages of like doing the online trainings, getting ready to, you know, go into the lab. But, you know, I have already projects and ideas outlined between my own and also working with grad students that are in the lab. So tell us about your proposed postdoctoral research um, plan. Sure. So... For my postdoc, I'm doing a postdoc at the University of Michigan under Dr. Lola Iniola Adefeso. And so in her lab, it's a chemical engineering lab, so it's a little bit of a shift 
kind of going from biomedical engineering to chemical engineering. But in this lab, she uses, well, her main focus right now is using like biocompatible and functional microparticles to for targeted delivery. For my postdoc research, it's kind of using these particles that her lab has developed and either altering them to where we can target specific either diseases or cancer models. And so there is one project that has a COVID um, application, and then there is another project that has a colon cancer application using these different microparticles. And so recently she published a paper in Science Advances about neutrophils preferentially um, taking up different size particles and so we're hoping to kind of use that in an, an approach to target specific lung uh, inflammatory diseases. So those are just like some of the different projects that I will be working on within my postdoc research. But mostly because I have a lot of animal experience in my work, I'll be doing a lot of animal research, animal um, animal work that will be using these different type of disease models. That's cool. And is there anything you're nervous about as you start your postdoc? I, again, another little bit of a shift. I mean, it's still engineering, but doing biomedical and switching to chemical engineering, it's back, I guess, to my undergrad a little bit, but I haven't done strict chemistry in a while or looked at an NMR or any SEM imaging. So again, that's all going to be kind of new and learning curve. And then even as a postdoc, you still sometimes, you don't, you know, you don't know everything. The more and more you get into a PhD, you realize the less and less you know, because you become so specific and a little bit kind of, you know, narrowed in what your topic is. But it's kind of refreshing to go to a new place and learn new things. But it's still scary at the same time. Like I'm a postdoc. Yes, I have my PhD. But, you know, there's still things I don't know and still things I need to learn. And I'm not going to have all the answers if, you know, the grad students like come to me. But I'm willing to find out. And I think that's like kind of what is part of our research or an investigator's kind of like core. As long as you're willing to like find answers or help solve the problem, it can kind of take that nervousness away. So yeah, I'm, it's still a new environment. It's still a new lab. And then with COVID, like I'm not sure how everything's always going to work out all the time. So, you know, I'm definitely nervous, but talking to the lab, talking to Dr. Neola, it, it helps definitely kind of subdue that nervousness and more focus on, you know, the tasks that are at hand. So my final question for you is, can you give us three tips for up and coming biomedical engineers? Yes. So my three tips for upcoming biomedical engineers is one, Determine which specific subfield that you want to go into biomedical engineering early. The second one is when it comes to instrument handling, make sure you understand everything about that instrument and about your model. And then three, everyone should have some type of background in, some, in computational engineering. You should have some experience with computer science. But the number one, as far as like having a sub field that you want to specialize in, biomedical engineering is a very multidisciplinary kind of broad field. And so you can have um, a sub field such as medical imaging, uh, orthopedics, bone mechanics, uh, cellular engineering, nanotechnology, drug delivery. There's just so many different avenues. And I think the earlier you identify that specific subfield and start taking courses and classes and reading the literature and finding out what's been done and what's new and what you could do, it'll make your process a lot easier, whether it's in industry or in academia, and will put you ahead of the game. So for my second one, as far as like understanding your instruments, we use a lot of different instruments for biomedical engineering, whether it's a flow cytometer, or SCM, or a Western blot imager. And I think what helps throughout a program or through a job is if you can completely understand these different types of instruments, the principles behind them, what they do, what the output means, how you can analyze that output. It'll make you a better biomedical engineer and also make your job a lot lot easier. And then if you can explain it better when you're training someone, it'll definitely um, put the idea of how a machine works in your forefront and then make a lot of the processing a lot easier. And then the last 
point as far as knowing any type of computer science or computational modeling. Due to COVID, um, seeing the transition from going in lab and being there to actually being at home and working from home, I think having that expertise and that knowledge just in case something like this happens again is really something that should be considered and be in the forefront of everyone's mind. Technology, computers, it's the future. So I think everyone should have some type of computational modeling experience or computer science work in biomedical engineering, no matter what your project is. If it's bone remodeling, if it's cell rolling, if it's uh, prediction uh, based off of current things that are used in clinic, you need to have some type of computer experience. Say one word that makes you happy. Wine. <laughs> yes. I really love wine. You feel just grown and sexy drinking it. If you want to connect with Dr. Grayson, you can see her at Team Corey on the socials. If you want to connect with me, I am at The Research Her on all the socials. You can also go to TheResearchHer.com. And until next time, I holla.